pounds. And so uh, in, in my usual pattern, I'm going to welcome you and say thank you so much for taking time out to come to Grand Rounds and uh, learn about medicine in a great forum. Uh, so my little meteorological nature statement for the day is I was raking off my perennial beds this year, and uh, when I raked away the leaves on one, my Lenten rose was blooming. And that's my very first perennial, and so that was super exciting. It means spring is actually really going to come. So today I'm very honored to talk uh, about this next series of Grand Rounds, which is our Dream Speaker Grand Rounds. And the Dream Speaker Grand Rounds is a series of four Grand Rounds. Each of our chief residents picks someone who's been inspirational to them uh, in some way or in an area of interest that they are interested in. And our sponsor for the Dream Speaker today is Dr. Sam Marie Boehner. And our Dream Speaker is Angela Hewitt. And she, Dr. Hewitt, is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And her talk today is Medical Management of Patients with Ebola, the Nebraska Experience. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Hewlett now. And one thing that I found out last night at dinner is both Dr. Murray Boehner and Dr. Hewlett were inspired to become physicians by the same book. And that book was The Hot Zone, which was written in 1994, and that's a thriller that's based on the origins and the incidents involving hemorrhagic fever and really focuses on Ebola virus as one of, one of those. So I, I thought that was really uh, just amazing. So Dr. Hewlett uh, earned her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Texas in Austin, and then her MD degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, where she also completed her residency program. She was a chief resident there, and then completed a two-year fellowship in infectious diseases, followed by a one-year NIH-funded research fellowship with a focus in hospital epidemiology and infection control. While she was in Texas, she also received a master's degree in clinical sciences and clinical investigation from the University of Texas Medical Branch. She's an associate professor in internal medicine and infectious diseases, as I mentioned before. She also holds joint appointments in the College of Public Health and in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and, in, and is in that role uh, heads the uh, Orthopedic Infectious Diseases Service. And that was the interesting thing we talked about last night as well. So in the area of Ebola, she serves as the medical director of the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. She actively has participated in the care of several patients with the Ebola virus in 2014 at her institution, and since that time has been a subject matter expert in this area on the clinical management of treatment of patients with Ebola through the CDC training course for the Ebola treatment facilities and the Ebola, and the Ebola assessment facilities. And she also does assessment of designed Ebola training centers in coordination with the CDC, the NIS, NIOSH, and State Departments of Health. And she is also faculty in the National Ebola Training and Education Center, which provides education and training to hospitals who are preparing to treat people with Ebola and other highly infectious diseases. She is involved in many esteemed societies. She's in the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America. She's also a fellow in the Infectious Disease Society of America. And in her other area of interest, which is in orthopedic infections, she serves on the executive board of the Musculoskeletal Infection Society and is the president of the Nebraska Infection Control Network. She has over 75 publications and books, and in, 19, in 2018 just uh, had a book published called Planning for Bioemergencies, a Guide to Healthcare Facilities. I think when you look at her, she is the true triple threat. When I was looking through her awards, she's also a fabulous educator, and in 2017, she received the uh, University of Nebraska Department of Internal Medicine Top Teacher Award for residents and medical students. I'm just going to take a brief pause here, and I, I told her a little bit about this. I just saw someone, work, uh, before she talks, walk in the room. Um, I want to just let everyone know that Robin Perrins, who is our media communications person, has been part of the Department of Medicine for many years, is moving to the dean's office to assume that same role, and she's here at every Grand Rounds faithfully. Um, this is her last Grand Rounds, 
And she has moved forward the Department of Medicine uh, in media and communications in a way we've never had before. And so, uh, Robin, if you could stand up so we could just thank you. With that, Dr. Hewlett, come on up and give us your grand rounds. All right, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yeah, all right, great, all right. Well, thank you so much for that, that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you to the whole uh, Department of Internal Medicine for the invitation to come here and speak to you guys today, and especially thank you to Dr. Murray Boehner. Um, I, and I told them this last night at dinner, if you would have told me 10 years ago that someone would be asking me to come and be a dream speaker at a Grand Rounds in Wisconsin, I would have absolutely said, oh, you've got to be kidding. You know? And so this is a real, um, a real treat for me to be here and a real honor uh, to come and, and speak to you guys about, about something that I know something about, which is even more wonderful. Um, you know, I love talking about things that I actually enjoy talking about and know things about. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about the clinical management of patients with Ebola virus. Um, I do have, I've earned a few disclosures actually uh, fairly recently. I do serve as principal investigator and I receive research support on two different studies. One is an investigational therapeutic product uh, called ZMAP, um, which you will hear about in the presentation, uh, mainly because it's a real part of, of what's going on as far as the therapy um, for Ebola virus disease. And then the other is a multi-center study for um, an Ebola vaccine, which you'll also hear some about in the presentation as well. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I actually uh, did receive a very, very small royalty check for a lot of work on a, a, a textbook on biopreparedness last year as well uh, through Springer. So we're going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, uh, some of the clinical manifestations uh, of Ebola virus disease, and then describe some of the clinical and operational lessons learned through caring for these patients with Ebola. Um, we're also going to talk about some programs and different educational resources you know, that are available if, if you want more information or more education. Um, it was mentioned, the, the Hot Zone, that was a book that I read, and it actually was in real time. I did read it in 1995, I think, um, you know, right after it came out. Uh, I was in college at the time and was considering a career in medicine, and I'll tell you what, I read that book and immediately went and registered for a human infectious diseases course and a public health bacteriology lab at my undergrad, and it basically snowballed from there. And I uh, went into medical school uh, planning to be an infectious diseases specialist, <laughs> and, uh, and I joked last night, they called me the embryonic ID fellow at uh, University of Texas because I kind of went up to him first year and said, hey, I'd like to go work in the HIV clinic. You have something for me to do. And so, uh, so anyway, it's interesting how we all get, get started on that, on that path. I'm going to give you a little bit of background first about the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. As mentioned, I'm currently the medical director of this unit. I served as associate medical director uh, from 2009 up until 2016 when our medical director uh, retired. The unit actually, though, was open in 2005, and so we've been around for a while. Um, we are the second oldest unit in the United States. Uh, the Emory unit opened in 2004, so around that same time period. And the real reason for opening a, a biocontainment unit in Nebraska, which I get that question all the time, why Nebraska, why, you know, why did they, these resources invested and, you know, that sort of thing. And the real answer is in 2003, some of you may remember the SARS outbreaks that were going on uh, mostly in Asia. They also had a fair amount of imported cases into Toronto, Canada, where a fair amount of healthcare workers got sick. There were some deaths. It was a very significant scenario. And so that was all kind of occurring around that time. And then you also remember the Amerithrax issues um, after 9-11, after, uh, where, you know, people were concerned about these, you know, emerging pathogens and uh, where would we take care of patients with, uh, with these kind of highly communicable diseases. And so, so essentially, this, that's where the unit was formed from. And Phil Smith, who um, is the person that actually hired me from, out of Texas to Nebraska to be the associate medical director of the unit, is the one that founded our unit back in 2005. It is an unusual looking facility. It's different than your usual hospital setup in that uh, we have a separate air handling system, so we don't share air with any of the rest of the hospital. Um, we have 10 beds, actually, that are five rooms of double, double bedded rooms. Um, all are vent capable, and so we're ICU capable in all of our rooms. Um, we don't recirculate air within the facility. Everything is negative pressure. Um, it's a gradient negative pressure, so the rooms are negative to the corridor, which is negative to the corridor outside. Uh, so kind of, a, again, a very interesting facility. We have a lot of air exchanges as well, which uh, if a typical tuberculosis negative pressure room would have around 12 air exchanges, uh, we typically, during activation, have around 20 to 25 actually. So our minimum is 15. Um, generally when we kick into activation mode, you can really hear that air circulating um, throughout the unit and it becomes fairly loud actually. 
Uh, we do have HEPA filtered air, so our, all of our air is HEPA filtered on the way out. We're on the top floor of a, a university hospital a building, actually. We have an in-unit laboratory that's run by our Nebraska Public Health Lab, and so we actually they deploy techs out to process our lab specimens within the biocontainment unit. Uh, we also have uh, different ways to sterilize uh, everything that goes out of our unit. So we have two autoclaves um, that you can see the, the photo there on the top that are actually in our unit. And this was a huge um, sort of nice, uh, you know, sort of forethought on, on Dr. Smith's part in the fact that when we cared for our patients with Ebola, we were able to put all of our waste through these autoclaves on the way out. Um, people that did not have autoclaves in place that cared for Ebola patients, unfortunately, had to box all of their waste. And um, there's some really interesting anecdotal stories about, um, you know, trucks driving from New York down to Texas where to incinerate the waste, and there were the governors writing in laws saying, you can't take this waste through our state along the way, so they made this sort of crazy, you know, scenario. So for all, all three of our patients with active Ebola virus disease, we did generate a lot of waste. Um, the cost was around $20,000 total for our waste processing, whereas that one patient that was cared for in New York with no autoclave in place was upwards of a million dollars um, for one patient just to dispose of the waste. So again, very significant scenario and something we, we were happy that we had uh, for sure. We do have a transportation system as well. You can see the photo here. We call it the isopod. Uh, it's where we, we place our patients when they're on the way into our unit. Um, we have a video conferencing system within the unit so that we can do things outside of the actual patient care room and not have everybody pile into the patient care room, which is, um, I'll show you some photos later of, of how we do that. So I think the real backbone to our unit, and, and again, a lot of thought went into our leadership team on the part of Phil Smith when he was forming, um, you know, planning the unit. We have a group of medical directors. I have several associate directors that are in that, in that group. Uh, some are infectious diseases. Most are infectious diseases. Uh, we do have a pediatric infectious diseases medical director as well. Um, we are an all-hazards, all-ages unit, and so we are capable of taking care of children, obstetrics, which kind of scares me a little bit, but obstetrics <laughs> and, um, <laughs> scares internists in general. Um, we have uh, a lot of nursing leadership on this team as well, uh, critical care physicians, uh, nursing managers. You know, we have a transport and decon specialist who deals with our patients when they are actually in, in transit and then also helps with the, the decontamination in the unit. We have our associate vice chancellor for clinical research is actually on our, our leadership team, which in 2014, when we were activating, actually, he was not part of the team. However, incredibly quickly, he became a real part of our team, and it's because he would ha was able to negotiate some of these experimental products we were using, assist with the IRB. These were things that we really didn't have the capacity of doing while we were caring for these patients, and so he became an absolutely integral part of the team and continues to, to do so. So we are an all-volunteer team, all-volunteer staff. Um, we have an extensive interview process. Our, our team is on call 24-7. Um, with a uh, notification system via pager or cell phone. We do uh, quite a few trainings, uh, you know, monthly staff meetings, uh, quarterly uh, drills at least, usually more than that, and a variety of other programming and things like that in between. So you can see some photos of some of our, some of our drills up here. Our team actually consists of uh, mostly nurses. So we have about, I think it's about 48 nursing staff uh, officially part of our team. Now these aren't all RNs. We actually have some patient care techs on the team, some respiratory therapists as well. Um, our nurses come from all over the hospital. They're not just critical care nurses. Uh, we actually find that pretty useful because we don't want to disable our ICUs when we take care of these patients by taking all the critical care nurses out of the ICU and putting them in the biocontainment unit. Our physician team, we have about 33 uh, physicians that are part of our team, mostly infectious diseases and critical care physicians. However, we have some other specialties, and I mentioned OB and, and uh, pediatrics. We also have surgeons, uh, which I, I can tell you recently, kind of interestingly, I, um, we brought a CT surgeon onto our team. Not somebody I ever thought I would even you know, consider with Ebola particularly, but uh, there are definitely diseases, uh, MERS-CoV being one of them, where they've used ECMO on these patients. In Korea, where they had a large outbreak, uh, Saudi Arabia, places like that. And so now we have an ECMO protocol for the biocontainment unit for airborne diseases. Again, not, not applicable to Ebola. But we have a wide variety of physician specialties on, on our team. So we do a lot of education and drills, both internally and externally. You can see some photos here, a lot with emergency responders of varying sorts, um, other healthcare facilities. We were just discussing a drill that we, that we have done in the past, and actually we're going to do a similar one coming up with Barnes-Jewish Hospital um, uh, in St. Louis, which is about a six, six and a half hour drive from Omaha, but a transport drill. If they were to receive a patient, 
transporting to Omaha, you know, to, for care. Um, we do a lot with the military, actually, and we have a, a very extensive relationship with various military entities, in particular the Air Force. And we actually have Air Force, an Air Force infectious diseases team who now is stationed on our campus to train with us in the biocontainment unit that consists of a physician um, a, and a nurse and a public health technician. And so we, we do a lot with the military as far as drills go. Um, just like civilians, military needs to know what to do if they have patients or people that become exposed or uh, ill with these types of illnesses. And there aren't any biocontainment units within the military hospital system. And so they would potentially go to civilian units. And so this is why it's important that we, we maintain that relationship with them. We do a lot of drills with uh, internally as well. You can see some of the photos there. I mentioned pediatrics. Um, we have pediatric nurses. We actually have an arrangement with Children's Hospital in town where the, uh, there are some pediatric nurses from Children's who are actually duly credentialed at our facility. Um, they do not train all the time with our team, but they come in and we have the ability to actually have them come in and pair with our, one of our biocontainment nurses um, to provide the pediatric care while the biocontainment nurse provides the, you know, the kind of bedside uh, biocontainment type care. So we do a fair amount of that. You can see actually on the, on the right, that photo is a, of a trauma surgeon and there's an anesthesiologist standing behind them and this is in a drill in the operating room. Not necessarily operating room for confirmed patient with Ebola, but operating room for a patient that comes into the emergency department maybe has some symptoms and a travel history consistent with Ebola, but has not been ruled in yet. And my nightmare and what I know, you know, people have all thought about lots of places is if you have the right travel history and you have, you know, a symptomology, which is incredibly um, nonspecific in the beginning, then the problem is you also could have an acute abdomen. You know, you could have other things. And do you want to miss that, you know, um, perforated viscous or et cetera, because you're worried about Ebola virus disease. And so we, uh, we have a, a protocol actually for, for operating room that we had to have had to drill multiple times. Um, we also, things are kind of hard sometimes to do in the unit that are easy on the regular floor. This is a, a portable x-ray is actually a little more difficult in the biocontainment unit than it would be, uh, you know, ordering on the regular floor, but we get it done. Um, you can see the kind of giant um, you know, plastic device that goes over it. We do a lot of things in the biocontainment unit that are actually not patient care, direct patient care as well. A lot of research initiatives. These were actually going on way prior to our activation for Ebola in, in 2014. And so things like decontamination. I mean, we have this facility that has its own air handling unit. What a better place, you know, to do decontamination studies with gases and things like that, where if you were doing these in a regular hospital room, you would have to shut down, you know, the entire wing or unit of the hospital, and people tend to frown on that. And so we were able to do some things in the unit that actually are pretty creative and innovative um, and really can only be done in, in that type of setting. Um, I did a, a study in, in 2009, actually, with, um, with thermal imaging for fever screening in an emergency department. We've done you know, a variety of mathematical modeling projects and other things. Um, and then lately, our big thing has been experimental drugs and products, and I'll get to some of those um, that, uh, that I'm going to talk about later. So a little background on Ebola virus disease in general. Um, Ebola is a term to viral hemorrhagic fever. There are a lot of viral hemorrhagic fevers out there. Uh, some are things that you think about uh, that you don't think would be related to Ebola, like dengue, you know, things like the hantavirus. Um, however, there, um, there are also a group of, of viruses that fall in the category, fetal virus category, which is Ebola and Marburg. Um, these are, are, there are actually six subtypes of Ebola. There's one actually discovered very recently, which they don't know, haven't been any human cases yet. Um, that was just, uh, just discovered last year. And then Ebola restin, we were talking about the hot zone earlier. And so that's actually, the book is actually about Ebola restin, which actually was discovered in the United States um, and in primates, and interestingly did not infect or did not cause disease in humans, actually did induce antibody response in humans, but, um, but did not cause clinical disease. So again, there are quite a few different subtypes here. Um, the one that I'm going to be speaking most to is Ebola Zaire, which is the one that has caused the most recent outbreaks, um, and particularly the large one in 2014, 2016, and actually the current outbreak in the Congo as well. So just a little bit about Ebola virus uh, ecology, transmission, how, you know, where, where does this virus come from? So essentially you have animal to animal transmission first. So bats are definitely thought to be a source. In fact, the outbreak in 2014 they think actually started with a young child in Guinea who actually was playing around a tree that had a lot of bat, you know, bat um, uh, infestation there in the tree. And so they think that that was patient zero for the large outbreak that ended up causing uh, 28,000 cases of Ebola. And so also primates are definitely, definitely part of that cycle. Um, primates do actually become ill with this virus. And so if you think about it, though, in Africa, 
you know, there are a variety of practices that involve bushmeat, um, you know, c consuming bushmeat. And if you think about it, if you're running after a bunch of monkeys to try to get some bushmeat and the sick one falls behind and that's the one that you tend to catch, um, and actually you don't get Ebola necessarily from eating the bushmeat, it's more from the handling of, you know, of the remains um, and, the, you know, the kind of the, that process of, of cooking the meat. Um, then you have a spillover event. So somehow, you know, one of those animals has contact with humans and you have a human that becomes infected. And then you start seeing human-to-human -human transmission, uh, which definitely can occur in close contact, um, especially with healthcare workers, and we've definitely seen that. And then you have a group of survivors. So you definitely, and I'll tell you a little bit about cl the clinical presentation, but, um, but this is a terrible disease. It has a high mortality rate. But we're seeing a fair amount of survivors, especially when in 2014, 2016, when uh, the disease infected, you know, like I said, around 28,000 people, um, there were, or were a fair amount of survivors in that, which was something that we had never really seen before because the previous outbreaks were much smaller. So speaking of a little bit of history, Ebola was discovered in 1976. So this is not a, not a new virus uh, by any means. It was near the Ebola River, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, since then, there have been some sporadic outbreaks throughout Africa, and you can see the map there of the different, uh, different outbreaks that have occurred. Generally, though, these outbreaks have been fairly small, so limited to 100, 200, sometimes less cases, and they were in fairly remote areas in Africa. And so you may see a village affected, but then actually at the time, you know, you were able to kind of come in, help was able to get there, you were able to kind of block off the transit and take care of people and essentially, you know, prohibit the spread of this virus. The problem with 2014-2016 is that that outbreak actually occurred in West Africa, so a completely different part of Africa that had never seen Ebola virus before. So this was uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. And that also, it, we have, there were some large cities that were involved, and so this was not remote village where you can block everybody off. These were big cities, upwards of a million people. Um, and when you have a lot of close contact, this transmission of Ebola becomes a lot easier. And so again, more than 28,000 cases, more than 11,000 deaths associated with that outbreak in 2014, 2016. And then there is a current outbreak going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You may have seen in the news, this is very disturbing um, to us in the fact that they have now, actually I had to submit the slides a couple of weeks ago, now there are more than 1,200 cases um, in the DRC. And unfortunately it's occurring in an area of the Congo that is, uh, has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, sort of, uh, political distress going on right now, a lot of militant groups and that sort of thing. And so there are there have been attacks on healthcare facilities, attacks on Ebola patients, I mean, just a, a wide variety of just very uh, disturbing things going on there, making response uh, very difficult and dangerous for, um, for the response teams. So how contagious is Ebola? I get this all the time. Is this a really contagious disease? Is this not, not really, actually, in, in reference to other diseases? So look at measles up there. So this is, for those of you that have had any uh, public health training, um, this is the, the r not designation, which is the, uh, the amount of people that one sick person can go on to infect. And so Ebola's is around two. And so for every Ebola patient, generally, two people are the ones that you can infect. But look at measles. I mean, we're talking about 18. And obviously, we're seeing that right now in the United States and across the world, where they will have one case of measles and many, many subsequent cases, especially the airborne diseases. But you can see that there are many other things that are higher than Ebola virus disease in that category. This is the scary part. And this data is actually from uh, Sina Bavari, who is uh, the uh, uh, chief uh, medical officer at USAMRID. So, the problem is, is that Ebola is highly infectious. So it may not be as contagious, but it's very, very, very infectious. And so in primate studies, it looks like that one virion can actually induce disease. And so that's a very different scenario than most of the infections that we think about where, you know, if you have an influenza patient in a room, you need to inhale some particles, you know, in order to actually get sick. Now, one virion of influenza probably won't induce disease. But that is not the case, actually, with Ebola. So Ebola, and that's what makes it scary, is that if you, know, if you have a disease that has this type of, um, of you know, infectivity, then you're dealing with a very significant scenario as far as transmission person to person, even if it's not very contagious per se. And so this is where it gets kind of scary, and one reason that we wear a lot of protective equipment and have our, our protocols in place in the biocontainment unit. Um, as far as who's at risk for Ebola, healthcare workers, household contacts, people in close contact with Ebola patients, uh, people that assist with burial process. These are real pictures, also from Dr. Bavari. Um, you know, there's, the burial process in Africa is somewhat different uh, culturally than it is here and involves a lot more hands-on contact with the family. 
And so it may be that the family is in charge of washing the patient or, you know, taking care of kind of the final things around, around the body and that sort of thing, which is not what we do here in the U.S. Well, unfortunately, if someone dies of Ebola and they have that, you know, the secretions on them and one, one virion causing infection, then there's definitely a possibility of, of infecting those around you and especially people that assist with that burial process. And so that was something that really had to be, um, you know, uh, educated uh, significantly over in, in Africa during, during the outbreak and is still going on now. So as far as clinically, what do we see with Ebola virus disease? Incubation is generally 2 to 21 days, so that's fairly, fairly wide, but usually it's around a week or so or a little bit longer. Um, from, uh, um, from initial exposure to symptom onset. Then you get this sort of nonspecific symptoms, you know, fever, myalgia, maybe some headaches, just don't feel very well. Incredibly nonspecific, though. And again, we're talking about, you know, um, um, people who are traveling from Africa or in Africa. There are lots of things in Africa that cause these exact same symptoms initially. And so this is very, very nonspecific. However, after that, so they spend usually a few days in that, that stage, and then they progress into what we call the, the wet stage or the secretory stage, and that's where you start having just massive amounts of vomiting, diarrhea, um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of nausea, just, you know, anorexia and that sort of thing. And there had been, when I say massive amounts, um, 10 liters of diarrhea was uh, clocked at one of the, one of the uh, biocontainment units, actually, that cared for a patient with Ebola. So... Daily, so that's daily, <laughs> so 10 liters a day. And so that's a lot of watery diarrhea. Um, other symptoms can be present as well, cough. Uh, we did see some conjunctivitis in our patients as well as uveitis later on, uh, pharyngitis, cough, interestingly hiccups in 28% of patients in one series. Um, hemorrhagic symptoms, though, actually only happen, uh, that's less than 20% of patients. And so if you open up a textbook on Ebola, it usually shows a picture of somebody with bleeding everything, you know, bleeding eyes, you know, that sort of thing, kind of uh, uh, crazy looking. That's actually not the case most of the time. A lot of times you won't see overt hemorrhage in these patients. However, what you do see is that if the patients don't get better after the first week, then they go one or two ways. It's either, you know, absolute organ failure. It looks like... Uh, looks like end-stage sepsis, essentially, is what it looks like. Just massive um, shock, then hemorrhaging sometimes, um, and multi-organ failure. Or they actually take their trajectory, or they go on and start to, start to improve and recover. And so it usually, by the second week, is when you kind of know how people are going to do, for the most part. And that first week is spent, though, in, in some, a lot of distress and, um, and, uh, and, again, very significant GI secretions. So as I mentioned early, symptoms of Ebola are very nonspecific and are seen in a lot of other diseases in Africa. Um, the available diagnostic test for Ebola virus disease, PCR, is typically what we use, serum PCR. Um, there are definitely other options as well, especially in the research uh, lab as far as virus isolation and such, um, immunohistochemistry, et cetera. But PCR is what we're using uh, clinically to diagnose patients. Um, it should be noted, though, that it can take actually three days for the PCR to become positive even after initial symptom onset. So this is the scary part about someone who comes into the emergency department, maybe has you know, a travel history and has these kind of very nonspecific symptoms, is even if you test them and it's negative, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. And so you really have to wait a 72-hour period and retest them before you decide that they may actually have an alternative diagnosis. And in those three days, a lot can happen. And so that's, as I mentioned, you know, um, other alternate diagnoses that could be present. Uh, instead of Ebola virus. But that's the part that is, is a little scary and that, you know, when you come in with the initial symptoms, it may take a while for the test to actually be positive. So as far as treatment of Ebola goes, we're very largely supportive. Um, you know, supporting just like you would support any ICU-type patient. Um, there aren't any FDA-approved therapeutic products. There are several that are under investigation and have been utilized. Uh, we used three different uh, experimental therapeutic products on our patients. Essentially, what was available is what we had. And especially in 2014, there was really not a lot of data out there. We do have a little more data than we had in 2014, and there has been a randomized controlled trial in Africa looking at ZMAP versus supportive care. They did see a benefit, it looked like, with ZMAP, but um, sort of good and bad, good, and that the outbreak was kind of, you know, tapering down at that time, bad, and that they weren't able to enroll enough patients to actually reach their statistical endpoints. So things were looking good. Um, we hope that that, that, that is the case. Um, there have also been a lot of non-randomized trials conducted with a variety of treatment agents, kind of anything we could find in 2014 that we may, thought may have some activity against Ebola, maybe in vitro, uh, people were using in, in patients at that time. Um, there have been some looking at convalescent plasma, actually, and we, we did use convalescent plasma in all three of our patients in 2014. Since that time, there actually was a study that looked like it did not produce a significant survival benefit. Um, that being said, 
you know, it's still out there and is a, is a potential option. Um, but again, not, wasn't looking good in, in, a, in a study that was done since 2014. There is actually a clinical trial underway in Africa that involves four arms. It's a randomized control trial looking at three different therapeutic agents, and they're actually using ZMAP as their control, and so along with the standard uh, supportive care. And so that actually will um, hopefully produce some res reasonable results that will help us kind of go forward. But again, currently no FDA-approved therapeutic products. There also are no FDA-approved vaccines, although there is a vaccine, and this is a live attenuated recombinant vaccine um, it's called, the, it's VSV actually, it's vesticular stomatitis virus. And the VS, it's the VSV of the glycoprotein actually that is replaced by um, a glycoprotein from Zaire strain of Ebola virus from a previous outbreak. And so what that does is induces an immune response. The data on this vaccine is actually looking, looking pretty good. And I can tell you um, in Africa, well, and let's go back. So two potential ways you can use a vaccine. Okay, so number one is preventative. So that means let's give the vaccine to everybody um, in Africa to try to present, you know, prevent the spread or the, um, the initial, uh, the initial uh, Ebola infection. And then the other is a post-exposure prophylaxis scenario where we're giving it to people who, you know, who have already been exposed in one way or the other. And there actually was an interesting study out of Guinea in 2015 where they, they looked at, they, they used something called a ring vaccination strategy, which um, if any of you are familiar with the smallpox literature, that was something that was utilized during, uh, during that time as well. But what they do is there are, and you can see the kind of the photo there, the vaccine is either, in this trial, was either given immediately um, or they waited 21 days. So people, everyone got the vaccine, but it was either given immediately after exposure or 21 days later to a group of about uh, 6,000 participants. Um, they actually, and so what they do is they vaccinate a ring. So you have an, a person that's infected here, and then you have your exposed people that are in direct close contact, and then you have the contacts of contacts, you know, healthcare workers, et cetera. And so they actually would ring vaccinate around that infected patient. And that, that study actually looked, you know, very good in that they didn't have any cases of Ebola in the group that was vaccinated immediately, and they had 23 cases in the group that had delayed vaccination. And so currently, right now, and this is actually sort of hot off the press, um, the World Health Organization now over in the Congo during the current outbreak has vaccinated about 95,000 people in the Congo right now with this vaccine. And they actually were looking at, you know, at some outcomes now um, of the vaccination process. And they, they demonstrated that out of the people that, um, that were vaccinated, I think there were 71 total Ebola cases out of 90 plus thousand individuals. And out of those 71, I think it was 53 of the cases actually occurred within like seven days of the vaccine. So in other words, they probably were too late um, to actually you know, reap the full benefits of the vaccine. That being said, that in that population, only nine of those patients died out of the 53. So it looks like that it may have conferred not only a partial immune response, um, but a very significant, if you think about you know, um, 70 people getting sick out of 90 plus thousand, it sounds like a vaccine that, that we really you know, probably will go on and, and use in a, in a real way at some point, and hopefully will be approved at some point as well. Uh, there are a lot of sequelae of Ebola infection. You know, these patients do not uh, you know, go on and kind of run off into the sunset after they're, you know, after they're ill. It's more like a, uh, it's almost like a monotype illness, actually, uh, towards the end of the illness and kind of during that, that recovery phase. People can also have kind of interesting clinical manifestations that were really essentially unknown prior to 2014 because the outbreaks had been small in these remote areas of Africa. Um, in 2014, though, you had a lot more survivors. You know, you had, you know, you had a, a fair amount, you know, 20 or uh, 19, 18,000 survivors. And so because of that, you were able to document more of these, these, um, these symptoms that people were having post. The uveitis was well documented actually in a case here in the United States of a patient that was cared for here in the U.S. And you can see the, the photo there is from the, um, the uh, article that was published in the New England Journal. This person actually had a color change in his eye. Uh, one eye was one color and the other eye was a different color. He lost complete vision in one eye. Um, and actually they were able to isolate Ebola virus not only via PCR but also via culture um, from his oculus fluid. So this was pretty, pretty significant at the time. No one really knew anything about that, and so just this discovery. And this was actually after recovery, so the patient had actually clinically recovered and was out of the hospital when this occurred. And there have been several cases actually in that same kind of realm since that time. We do think that Ebola can persist in bodily fluids for a long time, so things like seminal fluid, um, other kind of uh, immune privilege sites, uh, central nervous system, et cetera. And we definitely, there have been some really nice work actually looking at, at uh, sexual transmission of Ebola virus uh, after recovery, way, way, way down the road, sometimes months, even years after recovery, 
uh, that virus actually can persist in seminal fluid. And so they've had documented sexual transmission where you actually can type both viruses and see that, um, that the uh, transmission actually occurred. And then I mentioned relapse. Here are just some articles looking at that. There was a very striking case that happened in the UK, actually, a few years ago from a patient that had been managed in the UK uh, and had recovered, uh, recovered and actually was doing very well clinically and then had a resurgence um, of her Ebola that presented in the form of a raging meningoencephalitis uh, where they actually did a lumbar puncture and the CSF was positive for Ebola. So very, and again, this was months, um, almost a year, I think, after recovery. So very significant time period lapsed in between when this patient left the hospital and was doing fairly well and then had this, you know, had this recurrence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened to us in 2014. <laughs> this is a Nebraska Biocontainment Unit activation. You can see a photo there. These are all real photos, by the way, uh, that were taken during our activation process. This is actually us uh, offloading our, one of our patients off of the plane that delivered patients from Africa over to, uh, to Omaha. And so we cared for three patients, as was mentioned earlier. Um, these were sequential, so one patient in, in uh, September, one in October, and one in November of 2014. Our first patient was medically evacuated from Liberia, um, and I speak pretty freely about these patients. Actually, they are very, um, very well documented in the medical literature. Actually, the first patient is co-author on a couple papers with me and others, so, uh, and actually uh, the patients from memory in a similar scenario. So these patients are, when I, when I speak of them, and there are some photos and things like that, it's all with their, with their, um, their permission. So our first patient, actually a physician uh, who uh, was in Liberia caring for patients, became ill, was medically evacuated, and arrived to us about day number eight of his illness. And so he was into the secretory phase that I mentioned, where, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, such. Uh, he actually, you know, recovered and did fairly well and was discharged after about three weeks with us in our, in our unit. Our second patient, also medically evacuated from Liberia, he was around the same time, about a week or so into his illness, and he also recovered, did fairly well, was discharged at day number 17, of his hospitalization. And then our third patient, uh, unfortunately, I mean, this was a, a general surgeon, actually, who was over in Sierra Leone caring for patients, and he became infected. There was some delay in his um, diagnosis and then his, uh, his uh, uh, medical evacuation. And so he arrived to us on day number 13 and was already into the multi-organ failure um, uh, when he arrived. He actually had uh, renal failure, respiratory failure, was attended uh, when he came off the plane. And so he unfortunately spent about 72 hours with us, um, which were 72 hours of very aggressive ICU care involving ventilators, dialysis, kind of everything we had, uh, experimental products, um, but unfortunately he, he passed away. And so initially, what did we see in these patients? We saw fever, delirium. Um, a lot of that probably was multifactorial and that these patients were also on these planes from Africa and you know, going to a new place and were, you know, were obviously very ill. Um, severe fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as I mentioned. Uh, profoundly dehydrated. Uh, some patients had a, a rashes in varying stages, and then again, multi-organ failure in that later later stage of the illness. And so what did we do for these patients? This is what we do for every patient. We, we monitor them clinically. We go in and evaluate the condition of the patient initially. Um, we typically have one to two faculty physicians enter the room along with the nursing team. And then there are others. So this is actually a photo of rounds in the biocontainment unit. And so um, this is me sitting at the computer, observing. There's an anesthesiologist behind me, a critical care anesthesiologist. The person on the left there is actually a critical care fellow. And that was something that we got a lot of questions. Do we allow trainees in the unit? We did actually, and my take on that is I, I love to teach. And frankly, if you have a patient with Ebola virus disease in your facility, if we can do it in a safe manner, I think that there's absolutely no way that we shouldn't try to educate, you know, especially future generations of, of physicians. And so we did have uh, critical care fellows, infectious diseases fellows who came and were able to observe here in the nurse's station, uh, but not actually enter the patient room. And so you decrease the risk of exposure, but they're still able to communicate back and forth with the patient, um, you know, participate in the care, the lab monitoring, you know, that sort of thing. Um, we established IV access, so all of our patients actually received uh, central venous catheters up front. Um, these are some photos of, of some of the placement there. Um, we used the IJ as far as our, our placement strategy went, and we, the reason behind the central venous catheters was actually twofold. One is these patients are ICU level care and very sick and need you know, a good access. Um, the other is to facilitate phlebotomy. And so what you don't want to do is have your nursing team going in to draw multiple labs, especially our patient that was on dialysis. We were having to do Q6 hour lab draws for electrolytes, et cetera. You don't want that to happen. And so because you're risking um, sharps, you know, in a, a disease with, as I said, one virion causing infection. 
And so, so we actually place central lines in all of our patients. We monitor these really carefully. I can tell you, I mean, I've got background in infection control. I thought, here's what you don't need is a central line associated infection. You know, it's like, we got Ebola. You know, it's like, so let's do everything we possibly can to care for this catheter and, you know, not have this happen. <laughs> because you, you don't need, you know, to add problems onto what, uh, you know, what the patient already had, obviously. And so initially, we gave intravenous fluids. We had to watch fluid balance very carefully. That was something that we learned, actually, when we were caring for our patients, and that you can't just pile fluids on these patients because what happens is then they go into fluid pulmonary edema. And that actually happened, um, not just to us, but to a couple other uh, folks who, you know, when you're... Uh, when you're looking at a patient who seems profoundly dehydrated, your first thought is, let's replace some fluids. And so we did that, um, but in a much more controlled fashion later on where we would actually look at I's and O's and determine because when you just start dropping fluids into these patients, they actually start, um, start dropping those fluids into places that they don't need to be. So we did replace and monitor electrolytes. Our patients were profoundly hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic when they entered um, our facility. They had not had labs checked anywhere else. And at the time in Africa, um, there were no checking of labs going on in any of the treatment facilities. Uh, the currently, they actually have some enhanced capabilities on that. But at the time, there really wasn't much as far as lab monitoring that was going on. And we did try to control their nausea and vomiting diarrhea as best that we could. Um, we did give some antiemetics and antidiarrheal agents. There were a lot of debate back and forth on that. But there have been some papers published since then, and it looks like that that's probably a reasonable thing to do. And then we did aggressive supportive care measures for our critically ill. As I mentioned, um, we used uh, mechanical ventilation, dialysis on our last patient, uh, vasopressors, A-line placement, et cetera. So really kind of the full complement of ICU care. Um, patients were pretty sick, and they weren't able to maintain their, uh, their oral intake at all. And so we did use TPN in some of our patients at the advice of our critical care docs. Um, we did consult dietary and calorie counts and that sort of thing. You know, these folks don't necessarily have to come in the patient room. You know, we can do a lot of things via our, our computer system uh, where we, you know, they're able to talk to the patient and things like that and talk about food preferences and all that without actually uh, even coming into the unit. We would have a, a video set up actually outside in a conference room outside the unit for things like that. And then, as I mentioned, our patients did get investigational therapeutic products, all three of our patients. Um, there aren't any proven therapeutics. I gave you some of the data earlier that are looking a bit promising. But at the time, in 2014, we literally had nothing. And by nothing, I mean, uh, I, used, I told them last night, our first patient, we administered a therapeutic agent to that had ne never been given to a human for that purpose, um, which was pretty scary stuff. And, you know, an infusion, you know, we were concerned about infusion reactions and other things. But the problem is, is when you're dealing with a disease that has could, you know, upwards of, you know, 40 to 90 percent mortality, um, and there is some data available that this agent may be helpful, the patient, for sure, and, and we were willing to kind of take, you know, take that chance and to, um, to see if we could help them. And so, so this was, you know, a really interesting time. We used multiple different agents as listed up here um, for our patients, and I, I did mention convalescent serum earlier as well. So clinically, we monitored the patients. We monitored their viral loads, actually. Um, the, the testing was, that testing was sent to the CDC, who watched their viral loads. And you can see a picture there of the, uh, this is our, our first patient, who you can see their viral load and antibody response. Um, we did see a linear decline in the viral load, which correlated very well with the clinical response of the patient, actually. And so these were tracked throughout uh, the, the courses with the patient. And then we did a lot of recovery in the biopotamia unit. So imagine in a regular hospital when your patient feels better and they're out in the hall walking around with their IV pole and go visiting family and things like that. They don't have the capability of doing that in the unit. So they're with us in that room for the period of time until, um, until they are allowed to exit the premises. And so we did a lot of things with them. The picture actually on the left is one of our nurses playing chess with one of our patients. We had... Um, we had this very antiquated looking exercise bike. And the reason behind that is nobody wanted to give us a real exercise bike because they knew they weren't going to get it back. And so they, we gave us, they gave us this really uh, crazy looking one, but you know, whatever, it did the trick. And I, I tell the story all the time that when our first patient got on this bike and started riding it for the first time, I was sitting out in the nurse's station watching via video and I literally started crying in the nurse's station. And it's because this guy's a long distance bike rider and had literally been completely floored by this illness that was up and was able to ride. And he was like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And I'm just, I, I lost it in the middle of the nurse's station watching that. And we were also able to do a lot of family video conferencing and sort of a souped up HIPAA compliant Skype, if you will, um, and able to, uh, able to uh, talk to their families and that sort of thing when they were in the unit. And then our first two patients were feeling 
better um, towards the end of their hospitalization, but continued to have detectable viral loads. And so we actually uh, followed very strict discharge criteria established by the CDC, where they had to have two negative viral loads separated by 24 hours. And there's also some delay in transit of the samples from Nebraska to the CDC. And so that we were sort of sitting around waiting for these, you know, these viral loads to come back. But we were incredibly, um, incredibly happy, actually, when our, our first patient especially was discharged, uh, when we got that all clear and, and he was able to leave the unit. And you can see our, our patient actually is up there. And Phil Smith is, um, is uh, to the patient's uh, left there. And then I'm on the right. And then these are our critical care team uh, who help care for the patient. And then our second patient is actually there on the left. Um, and that's our lead nurse, Kate. Uh, and we have a little, a little get-together uh, in the conference room across with some treats and things like that. And it's kind of neat to, for everybody to see each other out of PPE. And so it makes things, makes things uh, very... Uh, uh, yeah, it was a good day, I'll put it that way. So um, clinical lessons learned, patients arrive critically ill, um, you know, often fever, nausea, vomiting, that sort of thing in the initial stages, and then multi-organ failure in later stages. And we really think that early entry into therapy, and I don't mean necessarily therapeutic products, uh, but early entry with aggressive supportive care measures, we really think can actually help this illness or, um, you know, kind of halt the progression of the illness. Um, we do think that there are probably multiple factors involved. Um, host factors definitely are, are an issue, um, you know, immune system-wise and otherwise. You know, therapeutic agents, as I said, initial viral load actually has something to do with it as well. Patients that are highly viremic on presentation, more likely to have adverse outcomes. Um, we don't know which one of these treatments, you know, or how, if these treatments actually played a role in recovery. We do think that now we do have a little bit more data coming out of Africa, especially with the current outbreak and, um, and the, the previous, saying that there may be some benefits to some of these investigational products, as well as supportive care. But again, um, nothing has been firmly established yet, and our, our, that research is, uh, is ongoing. Um, we do know that patients recover clinically but continue to have detectable serum viral loads, um, but continued profound fatigue, other symptoms, symptoms after recovery as well, and then there's a possibility of relapse. That's something that really people didn't understand uh, up until, until 2014, 2015, and so that's something that is a really new finding and is still you know, receiving different reports out of Africa about some of these, these sequelae that patients are experiencing. What we do know is that the case fatality rate for patients that were cared for in the United States and in Europe in centers like ours that have sophisticated um, supportive care and uh, ICU capabilities do better. And actually the mortality rate for pa the 27 patients that were cared for in those settings during the 2014-2016 outbreak um, was 18% compared to the, out the mortality in Africa at the time, which was, you know, depending on how you, which center you look at, you know, it could be upwards of 50 or more percent. And so this was a very significant finding in the fact that we think that supportive care by itself probably plays a big role, replacing electrolytes. You know, some of these patients, and you hear anecdotal reports out of Africa where people were doing, seemed like they were recovering, and then they would just sudden, sudden cardiac death type scenario. Were those people severely hypokalemic? You know, were they hypomagnesemic? I mean, they, nothing was really known because they didn't have the capability of looking for that. They were doing their best to try to orally replace electrolytes um, just blindly. And again, that's something that we definitely we're able to offer at our facility and, and others. And so uh, operational lessons learned, staffing, incredibly important. I mentioned our team earlier. You need several nurses and physicians caring for these patients. Nurses are needed. Our nurses are at the bedside 24-7 when we care for these patients. They work in shifts. Um, the main reason behind that is we don't like putting on and taking off the protective equipment to go in and you know check an IV pole or something like that. That's not something that we do in the unit. They, the nurses go in and actually stay at the bedside and also to be there for the patient, you know, make sure that everything is safe and, and taken care of. Um, and uh, the other thing that was sort of a, a finding as well is that the task in the biocontainment unit don't fit your original job description. Um, I do a lot of cleaning in the biocontainment unit. We don't, have, we don't have an environmental services group that comes in. We actually specifically don't want that. We want it to be us. And so we have some YouTube videos on how to shut off water supply for leaky toilets. We have, uh, this is a respiratory therapist up here on the right uh, who's mopping. <laughs> so so we, we do a lot of things. We do all of our own things in the unit um, in order to keep things central and to keep us, you know, being the ones that, because we're the ones that know how to wear the gear, we're the ones that know how to keep each other safe. Um, the administrative portion of this is a very, very, very significant thing that I can't stress enough. And I can tell you that when you're taking care of these patients, the patient care part is actually kind of the easy part. You know, going in and taking care of the patient, doing what you need to do, that's something we all do every day. 
Um, this part was hard. This is, you know, the camp Ebola set out, you know, CNN trucks and, you know, all these folks set out outside the hospital interviews. Um, you know, everyone wants to talk to you. The CDC and the WHO conference calls, I mean, daily sometimes. Just very, um, a lot of administrative uh, work that goes into this. And it just, yeah, <laughs> it was very difficult to maintain our, our day jobs, which don't stop. Um, you know, I was actually on the general ID consult service in September when we had our patient. Um, it was, you know, I did try to do that for a while, actually, but it was a little hard. Um, I made an arrangement with, with Phil, my partner there. Um, he said, well, I'll go dress up and see the patient if you do all the medical documentation in Epic. And it's like, all right, fine, you know, I'll do that. Actually, that was seeing the patient was the easy part, but what I was trying to do is not have to shower out because if I took care of the patient and showered out, I would actually have to go around then after that. And so um, so I did all the documentation on all of our patients, actually, and um, and. I can tell you, uh, yeah, there's some very interesting stories about how to bill for things like that. Like, you know, Dr. Hewlett spent 20 hours in the care of this patient today. You know, was, um, I'm not sure how that worked out, but, but uh, uh, kind of crazy. Um, protective equipment-wise, uh, you know, assessing the type of PPE to wear, maintaining that ability to scale up or down depending on the status of the patient. I think that's very important. We have a, a culture of safety is what we call it in our, in our unit and that we really want to maintain um, that we're all a team. We're all about protecting each other. Uh, it's something that is, is just ingrained in us, actually, and, and when you join the team, you really feel it. It's really palpable um, that, you know, we're, we're just, yeah. I mean, it's all about, you know, keeping each other safe and making sure that, you know, if you see a, a problem with the protective equipment or you see a problem with the procedures or anything like that, you speak up, and it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, a patient care tech or the, you know, ICU faculty member. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all about trying to, you know, to make sure that we're all, that we're all safe. Uh, waste disposal, we discussed that, a lot of waste generated. These were definitely significant learnings for us. Laboratory support, also very significant. It was great that we had our lab inside of our unit. The turnaround time was, you know, was, was much, much, much better than transporting samples even across campus to our public health lab. Um, was somewhat problematic. You know, who wants to walk with the cooler? It was always a little, um, you know, interesting as well. So. So we, uh, we wanted to maintain, though, a full complement of laboratory tests. We worked with our medical directors um, along with the, uh, the director of the labs to make sure that we were able to, to do these tests um, to make sure that we were able to take care of the patient uh, as, as we thought that we should. And then this is a huge issue, maintenance and preparedness, and making sure that your team is maintained, keeping your team excited, keeping them involved is actually a, a very difficult process. There are a lot of busy people, obviously, on these teams, trying to maintain those relationships with uh, external partners also. Uh, it can be problematic, and so we do a lot of things on staff engagement, a lot of trainings, just to try to keep people around to make sure that you know that they they continue to uh, to be part of our team. Funding obviously is is an issue as well. Making sure that you know we we being around the world, but especially in the United States, it tends to be where you know Ebola outbreak happens, and then people start throwing money at you. Let's you know let's do this, and then Ebola starts to kind of fade away, and then everybody forgets. You know, and so when that happens, then the funding stream goes away, and then it makes it more difficult to maintain and continue to do your work. Just a little shout out for the National Ebola Training and Education Center, or NETEC. This was formed actually um, as a result of the 2014 outbreak of Ebola virus disease. Uh, there, at that time, there were three biocontainment units caring for patients uh, in the United States. Uh, Bellevue Hospital, actually in New York City, successfully cared for a patient as well and became one of our core centers. And then we actually were able to, um, to engage 10, so 10 total regional treatment centers, and you can see the map there. Your regional treatment center is Minnesota, actually. Um, and so these are centers that are highly capable, have training protocols, have staffing, and that sort of thing to care for patients uh, with Ebola or another highly communicable uh, hazardous disease. Uh, we do a lot of training at other hospitals. We, we do a lot of site visits to other hospitals. It's a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, we also have a research infrastructure that's being created, a central uh, IRB, actually, to do research, uh, which is amazing, and we're very excited about that, so that once we do, um, you know, if we're caring for a patient, we're able to implement those research protocols, get those experimental products, do things like that in a, a timely fashion. And then another little shout-out locally for, um, for our, our place. Uh, we also, after our Ebola patients, we also had about eight people who were uh, physicians and nurses who were medically evacuated from Africa after high-risk exposures to Ebola. So they were not sick. They were brought to us to be close to the biocontainment unit in case they became ill. And so it's a quarantine situation. And so at that time, there wasn't a lot of guidance on what do you do with these well people, though, who are exposed and just need to be hanging around Omaha for a while. None of them were remotely from the area. And so, um, so it, what we decided to do, actually, we submitted a grant and were awarded a grant um, from the government to build the uh, 
governmental quarantine center. And so right now, this facility is um, almost finished, actually, on campus. It'll be, I think, another month. And it is multiple levels of training and simulation, not only for biocontainment, but also for our students and residents and um, other things. But it is a, also contains a 20-bed quarantine center. And so it'll be the only uh, facility of its kind in the United States, and I think will be a really nice improvement to what we had going on in 2014, 2015. Just a few resources for any of you that are interested in reading more about any of this. Go read the Hot Zone, like you know Sam and I talked about. But, um, but um, uh, there are definitely some email subscription lists. I like to keep keep updated on what's going on. I get multiple of these a day. Sometimes I'll read them, you know, really comprehensively. Other times I, usually when I'm in the Caribbean somewhere, I try to erase them very quickly. But um, but I, they're actually very interesting and and can really give you some up to date information on what's going on in the world. And so again, if you would like to seek more information. That's all I have for you. This is my, our team. You can see a picture of our team. This is in 2014. That was on discharge day with our patient and his wife, which I said was an absolutely beautiful, phenomenal day for us. And then this is uh, more recently doing the National Disaster Medical Systems training, uh, which we have multiple iterations of on our campus. And this was uh, earlier this year or last year. So thank you very much. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a great question. So he was talking about just the immense expense of the care of our patients here, but then also the needs in the countries that where we really need the money is actually where the outbreaks start. And so I 100% agree with you, I can say, in all of those points. Um, you know, here I think that what we've done is establish this regional 10, you know, 10 center uh, 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 treatment centers in the United States which at the time, actually, in 2014, and, and it's crazy, 2014 wasn't that long ago, but actually at that time there really wasn't a network of care you know, for patients with these types of diseases in the U.S. I think that the 10, the 10 regional centers have really done a good job of being sort of those centers and the fact that we're not spending a lot of money on having every medical center. And I, I know in 2014 there actually was some funding from the CDC where they established 55 you know, Ebola treatment centers in the United States. Well, the problem is those people all have to continue to maintain funding and maintain preparedness and all of that. And what they've really honed down to is to have these 10 centers that are focused. Um, but I 100% agree with you. If that money could actually be spent in the places where these outbreaks start, and that being said, there is, has been some improvements um, since 2014, and particularly in the care of patients actually overseas. I know, um, as I mentioned earlier, in 2014, most of the Ebola care in the Ebola treatment centers was actually very supportive, like, you know, um, oral rehydration fluid and, you know, oral potassium supplements and maybe an IV, you know, an antibiotic, but a lot of, not even IV fluids in a lot of places. That changed somewhat, and we have some more capabilities overseas. But yeah, I mean, I 100%. I, I think that that you know the really where this money is is needed is I think we should provide make sure that we're capable of providing care here through a limited number of centers but where the money is really really needed is where these outbreaks start to provide that education provide that care so that these outbreaks aren't perpetuated and you know and spread throughout the world and and there's a lot of lessons on you know measles now is a great example of how things can spread so quickly um, you know around the world especially with an airborne disease so yeah not, your point's very well taken any other questions for me Yeah, 
So great question. So he mentioned some of the other diseases. As I said, Ebola, very nonspecific on presentation. There are many other diseases that look like it. And in somebody who has the right epidemiologic history for Ebola, malaria is definitely up there. In fact, they've shown in, in some series that the co-infection rate for malaria and Ebola is around 20% and that the people that are infected with malaria actually, and Ebola actually do significantly worse than the people just infected with Ebola. If that's not bad enough, add malaria onto it. And it may be that malaria, the issue is that either there's a, there's a delay in management because you're concentrating on Ebola virus, um, or obviously malaria can be a bad disease as well. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, putting our patients that come in that we have suspicion epidemiologically, you know, travel to the right area, you know, that sort of thing. If you're worried about Ebola, then you definitely should at least isolate that individual and then get a real history though. Um, you know, we have a fair amount of people who we look at MERS-CoV, say, coming over from, I mean, Saudi Arabia, this is a very common, you know, travel area, uh, United Arab Emirates, et cetera. And, but the thing is, is they say, well, actually, I was sick before I went or, you know, I had, you know, this and they end up having influenza, you know. And so if you can find an alternate diagnosis, um, if you can, um, you know, can establish, but don't delay the care of these other illnesses. So definitely still do that epi assessment. You know, if they say they were bit by a whole bunch of ticks, you know, then you may want to start thinking about those diseases, but don't necessarily rule out Ebola just because they have something else. I guess that's my point is, um, especially with malaria, because it co-infection is so common that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to miss the uh, forest for the trees kind of thing. All right, any other questions? Come on up to the front. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you.